In this lecture, we'll continue with some more of those guidelines and how we can use more elements of ggplot2 to bring those in. We're going to talk about two of those guidelines in this lecture, meaningful labels and then highlighting. So the first is that guideline to use labels that are clear and meaningful. A lot of times we will use um, column names and we'll use kind of abbreviations for factor labels while we're coding. And they might be really short and convenient to use and we know exactly what they mean, but they are very user friendly once we start sharing those graphics with someone else. I've shown two graphs here again where I'm showing the same information, but I've changed the labeling to make it clearer on one of them. So a lot of times, if we directly create something with ggplot, we end up with something like this over here on the left, where we have kind of like maybe PLS for, for, um, for our passes and then POS for our position down here. And so for both of those, those might have been the column names that we were working with, which were fine and short and easy to type, but don't make a lot of sense to someone else. Um, here we have the, the labels that we were using for each of the levels of a factor that we had in a column that was the factor class. And so in this case, again, they're using abbreviations that if we've worked with the data a lot, we might know exactly what they mean. But in this case, it's not very clear to the user what DF or FW might mean. Over here on the right, I've shown this with a clearer label. So I'm showing the number of players on one of the axes, and I've spelled out exactly what that is. And then I've increased the, the information and the, the clarity, hopefully, of the labels for each of those positions. So now it's spelling out the midfielder and goalkeeper and so on. There are a few different strategies that you can use to make your labels clear in ggplot. One is to, to um, change the names that you have on the different scales in your ggplot. So the scales can include the x and y axis, but they can also include things like if you are using, if you're mapping color to a certain aesthetic, you'll get a, a color legend that kind of shows what each color indicates. That will have a title, and that's another one of the scales. That's the color scale. So the labs can be used to change the title on that as well. You can also get much more granular with this. So that's like one function that will let you change just those names pretty easily. But you can change a lot of the elements of the scales using these different functions that start with scale underscore. A lot of the names of these will correspond to first which scale you're using. So like X, Y, color, fill, position, uh, sorry, excuse me, um, uh, size. But then the other thing that you need to put in for many of these is what type of data you're working with, because that really defines how the scale comes out. So if you're working with um, discrete data, you could put discrete in. That might include something like a factor. If you're working with continuous numeric data, then you can put that in as continuous. A second thing that you can do is you can include units of measurement. You can do this both when you're labeling the axis or the, the scale, but you can also do it for the X and Y axis, and, and I believe for the others as well, if you want to put for the numbers themselves, like a percent sign after or a dollar sign before. There are functions for doing that type of labeling in a package called scales. So for example, inside your kind of like scale X continuous, if you wanted those numbers to show up with a percent as well and to be multiplied by 100, then you could do labels equals percent and it would allow you to do that. If those are dollars, the same way you could do labels equals dollar, and it would add on that dollar sign in front of each of the numbers that show up along that axis. The other thing that you can do that I think is maybe used less often than it should be because it's very easy, is if you have a certain variable that's along the x-axis and it's showing a factor and the labels are very long and aren't really fitting easily, so that you kind of have to flip them or move them around or they're overlapping each other, then what you can do is just flip your X and Y axes and then you put them in a side where they're much easier to read. There's a function called chord flip that stands for coordinate flip that allows you to do that really easily. So let's take a look at that using the World Cup example data. We're going to do a bar chart where we show the number of players per Per goal and we'll build up these elements where we make those labels a little bit nicer. So let's come over here. Um, in the very first video lecture for this chapter, I showed how to set up some data sets that we're using. So make sure you have that code if you want to follow along and run all of it. 
And today we're going to be working specifically with this World Cup data set. So let's take a look and remember what that looks like. I'll grab the, just the beginning of that. So we have different rows that are showing players in the 2010 World Cup, and then we have some information like the team and the position and so on. So in this case, I would like to create a plot where we are piping in this data. You could also add it as your first element in a ggplot call. And then for the aesthetics, let's do that x equals the position. Then I'm going to do a bar GM. And the default for this is it's going to show bars where it's showing the count in each of those factor levels. So across the x-axis, we have the different positions, defender, forward, goalkeeper, and so on. And then it has counted up how many rows belong to each of those factors. And on the y-axis, is showing those counts. So this is a case where we're doing one of those statistical GMs where it's taken our data and instead of showing one element per row in the original data set, like a, a scatter plot might for the GM point, instead here it's showing some summary of that. In that case, it's counted up the cases in each factor level and it's showing us that. So here we could do a few things. First of all, we might want to change this count to something that would be more meaningful for people. So we can use the labs to do that. And inside this labs, you can reassign any of the different scales that you have. You just use the name of that aesthetic. So here we are mapping the number of players to the y-axis. So we can change the aesthetic using y equals, and then let's put number of players. So let's try that out. And you can see over here in the plot, it's changed, uh, it's changed that value. If we wanted to, we could take this one out completely. Maybe we think that there's enough information just with these names. So in that case, because it, now we want to change the X one, we can do X equals, and we can just put nothing inside uh, quotation marks and run it. So now it's taken off that label completely. There are a few other ways to do that. We can, we'll can we get later very detailed into the themes where we change specific elements. And you could say, I don't even want that element at all and take it out. But this is a very easy way for right now to just um, take it out is to reassign it to have nothing in it with this um, quotation mark with nothing in it. So the other thing that we might want to do here is we have these different names. And these are a little bit long. And, and often in that case, especially if they were getting longer than this, they might start running into each other. And, and we might be tempted then to kind of tilt them or make them vertical. But instead of doing that, what we can do is just flip the axes. Where this was a statistical geom, we didn't set y to be equal to something. The default for geom bar is that it calculates that count and shows that on the y-axis. So we can't just kind of change our x and y aesthetics here. And instead, what we can do is do that chord flip, and that'll just flip those two. So you can see now it's changed it, and now we have this in a direction that's really easy to kind of read down. The next guideline was to provide useful references. So whenever you can, if you can add pieces that help the viewer see how unusual a point is, or points out what data are the unusual points, then that can be really helpful for the, the reader in terms of interpreting what was going on. So I've shown an example here. Um, on the left, I've shown just the number of deaths in July of 1995. But this might not be very helpful to somebody who's not familiar with data from the city for this, this type of outcome, because they might not have any idea of how to judge how unusual it was that you have this really large increase. So on the right, I've added this shading, and this shows the range of daily deaths in Chicago in July, so in that same month of the year, for several years before and several years after the year of the heat wave. That helps to show what a normal range is in that city for that time of the year. And now you can see how far outside the normal this particular event was. Another useful way is to show trend lines. This can help you explore the trends even when you've got quite a lot of data. So for example, here on the left, I'm showing passes versus shots for the World Cup data. 
And you can see that there's clearly some association where when you have more passes, you tend to also have more shots. We can add some trend lines though, and we can see in that case that for this particular outlier, which I think because it's off by itself, it really is kind of drawing the smooth line out a little bit, but we can see that that is kind of like a lot fewer shots than we might've expected based on the general trends that we see in a lot of the other players here where the data is dense. So for right now, I'm just going to show one example of how to add these references, but we'll work some more on how to add them with different um, boxes and polygons and things like that as we move forward. So one of the ways that you can do it is to add a smooth line with the GM smooth. And I say a smooth line, but really it could do a smooth line like we just saw, or it can also actually calculate a, a line from a linear regression. So let's try to plot in our studio where we do passes versus shots for the, the World Cup data, and then we'll add on uh, some smooth lines to it. So we can come down. Actually, we can just change what we have right here. All right, so in this case, I believe we did passes for our X aesthetic, and then to Y, we'll map shots. And then we're showing this with a point. So let's look just at that before we start adding things. And you can see our plot over here. The other thing I did in this example, and this is just again to remind you of how this works, is I did that, um, that theme for the Stephen Fuse. So things are a little bit simpler. Now we can add on the smooth line. This is one of those statistical geoms. So it's a geometric object that we're adding onto the plot. But it's statistical in the sense that instead of showing one thing per row that we had in our, orig our original data. Instead, it's taking that data and it's doing some kind of statistical calculation or summary on it, and then it's showing us the result of that. In this case, if we just do a smooth, it will show us the result of fitting a smooth line to that data. Again, we're really seeing that there are kind of some outliers there that might be interesting to explore. But there are also some different, um, uh, different arguments that you can use inside that, and one of them is the method. So this is saying, which method to use when it um, fits and adds that, that smooth line. And one of the ones you can do is LM, which, which stands for a linear model. And the result from this will be the, the line that you would get if you did a linear regression of shots regressed on passes. There are a number of different parameters that you can include for this GM smooth. Some of the key ones to know include method. That's the one that we just used where the default was to show a smooth line. And then we could use LM for a linear a result from fitting a linear model. And then GLM you could use to show the result from fitting a generalized linear model where you could do things like logistic. Um, with the default, if the number of points isn't too high, if it's less than 1,000, it fits a lowest curve. And if it's more than that, if it's a generalized additive model so that it's not too time consuming to add it. If you're doing a smooth, a true smooth, um, if the number of points are down in that area where it's doing a lowest curve, you can use span to say kind of like how straight or wiggly it would be. The smaller the value, the wigglier. So we can look right here. Again, here's the default. Let's do span equals, I don't know, maybe one. Nope, let's try something smaller than that, 0 0.1. All right, so you can see here, it's really kind of almost getting to that dot to dot point where it's connecting some pretty unusual and probably random patterns in here. Um, but then we can go up. Again, here's one, here's kind of the norm. We could go up and change it to 10 and we'll see things are getting even smoother. I don't know quite how smooth that looks like that's about as smooth as that's going to go. You can also specify whether or not you want that confidence region. So you can see that this comes with a gray area around it that's giving um, confidence intervals. If we do SE equals false, we can take this off. And now it's just showing the line. If you do want to show that confidence region, the default is 95% intervals, but you can use level to change that. So you could change it to 90% confidence intervals or 99%. Another useful way for adding references is to add lines and polygons. A number of these that are useful include H line and V line, which can add a horizontal or a vertical line. AB line, this can add a line with an intercept and a slope. 
polygon can add a filled polygon and then geom path can add an unfilled polygon. So we can look at an example of that here. Here I have added two horizontal lines. So say that we're looking at the data for sh Chicago. This is all of the data. And we wanted to show, we were told that a normal range for the number of deaths per day in the city is 77 to 139. We could add lines showing both of those points and then that adds this helpful reference. In this case, I'm using GMH line and it takes the aesthetic of the y-intercept, so where that line should intercept on the y-axis. In this case, I'm setting that not inside an aesthetic because I'm not mapping into something in our data, but instead I'm setting it as a constant. So this will plot lines where this is always the case. And then because I wanted it dotted instead of solid, I've specified the line type, and that's also with a constant. So you'll remember when we want to set the aesthetic, not based on something in the data, but to just a, a, a preset value, we can do that using, using a constant type of aesthetic and putting it outside of the AES call where we would otherwise kind of map column names to aesthetics. When you are adding these references, a few things to keep in mind. First of all, it is often helpful to put them behind the main points you want to show so that they really complement them rather than kind of like going on top where they keep you from being able to see the main data. If you want to do that, in some cases, you do need to add that layer on ggplot first. So you need that geom earlier up in your string of different layers in the ggplot, string of different things that you're adding with that plus sign. In some cases, it's helpful for them to be slightly transparent. So you can use alpha, again, as a constant value outside of an AES function call. In some cases, it's useful to use colors that kind of go a little bit in the background where you can see things if, if you need to, but they don't pop out as much as the, the real data. So in that case, you might want to use colors that are unobtrusive, like grays. And then finally, you might want to consider using line types that aren't solid. So things like line type equals two for dash or line type equals three for more dot.